Hello, now you will get into the window to the underworld, where you will see part 2 of the video of 10 mysterious police cases that are still unsolved. If you haven't seen the first part yet, be sure to watch it. You can find the first part in the hint in the upper right corner. But before I start, please click on like subscribe to the channel and click on the bell. Now let's get started. Number 5. The Boy in the Box. It was the year 1957 in Philadelphia. When a hunter found the bruised body of a boy in the J.C. Penney box. The boy around 4 to 6 years old, was nude and wrapped in flannel. He seemed to have died from blows to the head. Fearing his muskrat traps would be confiscated by police, the hunter didn't report the body. It was two days later, when a college student found the body, that the police started on the case of America's unknown child. It immediately attracted the media's attention. And flyers of the boy were seen throughout Pennsylvania. Although police received thousands of leads, they were never able to uncover the identity of the young boy. They tried tracing back the J.C. Penny box and checking the boy's fingerprints, but everything led to a dead end. However, there were two promising leads of note. One lead involved a foster home located 1.5 miles away. A medical examiner, who pursued the case until his death, had a psychic lead him to the foster home. Where he found a bassinet similar to the one that was sold in the box. Hanging on the clothesline were blankets much like the one wrapped around the boy. He believed the boy belonged to the stepdaughter of the man who ran the home, and she didn't want to be found as an unwed mother. Police interviewed the couple, but closed the investigation. In 2003, they opened the case again, when interviewing a woman identified as M who claimed her abusive mother bought the child back in 1954. According to her, her mother killed the boy in a fit of rage. Because M was mentally unstable, the investigation was closed as well, leaving the boy to remain America's unknown child. Number 4. The Jeanette de Palma Case. Usually people connect witches to Salem, Ma, but for this particular case, the witches were in Springfield, New Jersey. It all started in 1972, when a dog brought home a decomposed forearm home. This prompted a police search. And a body was soon found afterwards atop a cliff in Springfield. The body was identified to be that of Jeanette Depemer, a 16-year-old who had gone missing for six weeks. Immediately, rumors began spreading as to the cause of her death. The hill where she was discovered was covered with occult symbols and many believed her body was placed on a makeshift altar. Many locals, even some police members, blame the coven of witches, otherwise known as Satanists, who used a palma for a human sacrifice. Because of a flood, much of the case's details have since been destroyed. However, some reports from local papers mention that police couldn't determine the cause of death due to her badly decomposed body. They had also investigated a local homeless man who was a prime suspect, only to find no connection with the killing. As for the occult theory, many believe that De Palma may have provoked a group of Satan-worshipping teens at her high school when she was trying to evangelize them. She was involved with a group who helped drug addicts by finding faith in Christ. The reverend who ran the group theorized that she was selected as a sacrifice to the group because of this. Was she a human sacrifice? Or did these suspicions help hide the real killer? Perhaps no one will ever know. Number 3. The Glyco Moranaga Case. Okay, brace yourselves, because this case is as twisted as a TV crime show. It deals with the Japanese company's Izaki Glyco, best known for its Pocky snacks. And Moranaga, in 1984 two armed men in masks broke into CEO Katsuhisa Izaki's mother's home and bound her, taking the house key of Glyco's CEO. Entering his house, they also tied up his wife and daughter. Mrs. Izaki attempted to negotiate money with the men, but they were after something else. Cutting off the telephone cords, they raided the bathroom, where Izaki and his other two children were hiding. They abducted Izaki and held him hostage at a warehouse. They issued a ransom for 1 billion yen and 100 kilograms of gold bars. Their plans were discovered when Izaki managed to escape three days later. A few weeks later, just when the company thought it had escaped extortion, vehicles in its headquarters parking lot were set on fire. Then, a container with hydrochloric acid and a threatening letter addressed to Glyco were found in Ibaraki, where the warehouse was located. This began a string of letters from a person or a group that dubbed itself the monster with 21 faces, named after a villain in a Japanese detective series. The letters threatened the company's products, claiming that their candies were laced with potassium cyanide soda. 
Glyco was forced to pull the products off the shelves, resulting in a 21 million loss and the layoff of 450 part-time workers. After months of tormenting Glyco, the monster with 21 faces decided to look for fun someplace else. Their final letter towards the company read, We forgive Glyco. With that abrupt ending, they turned their sights on the food companies Meridai Ham, House Foods Corporation, and Fuji. In exchange of stopping their harassment towards Meridai, one of its employees was to hand them ransom money on a train. That was when an investigator, who disguised himself as an employee, saw the prime suspect, known as the fox-eyed man. The man was well-built, his hair cut short and permed, with eyes like those of a fox. After dropping the ransom as instructed, he and another investigator attempted to follow the fox-eyed man, only to lose him. They would get a second chance later on, but he again evaded them. After continuing harassment towards the police, a year later police superintendent Yamamoto committed suicide by setting himself on fire, ashamed of his failure to capture the fox-eyed man. Five days following the death, the monster with 21 faces sent its final letter to the media. Yamamoto of Shiga Prefecture Police died. How stupid of him. We've got no friends or secret hiding place in Shiga. It's Yoshino or Shikata who should have died. What have they been doing for, as long as one year and five months? Don't let bad guys like us get away with it. There are many more fools who want to copy us. No career Yamamoto died like a man. So we decided to give our condolence. We decided to forget about torturing food-making companies. It's not us, but someone copying us. We are bad guys. That means we've got more to do other than bullying companies. It's fun to lead a bad man's life monster with 21 faces. And with that final statement, the monster with 21 faces disappeared, never to be heard from again. Number 2. The SS Aurang Meeting. Ghost ships aren't just portrayed in legends and movies such as the Pirates of the Caribbean. In this true story, the entire crew mysteriously perished. It all started in 1947. When ships traveling the Straits of Malacca, located between Sumatra and Malaysia, heard a troubling distress call, all the officers, including the captain, are dead, lying in the control room and on the bridge. The entire crew may have been killed. The message was followed by some unintelligible Morse code, and then finally, I'm dying. An American ship called Silver Star answered the distress call and found the Aurang Meeden, but there were no signs of the crew on the deck. Even when they tried to call to them, and so they boarded the ship, only to find themselves in a horror scene. Scattered across the deck were the corpses of the Dutchmen, their faces construed in such a way one would think they had witnessed something ghastly before their demise. Even the dog was dead, its face also contorted in agony. The captain's body was found on the bridge, while the communication officer was still at his post, his cold fingers still pressing the telegraph. The American crew went down to the boiler deck to find the same situation. Despite it being over a hundred degrees down there, a cold chill came over them. Retreating to their ship again, they decided to tow the Aurang meat into port. But as soon as they attached a tow line, smoke began billowing out of the ship. Moments later it exploded, sinking into its watery grave, taking all its secrets along with it. What horrible thing did the crew witness? Some believe it was the work of the paranormal. Perhaps a band of ghost pirates raided the ship, or aliens decided to drop in. Such unexplainable things do happen, as firefighter and EMT McMayers have experienced in his firehouse. Others, however, have more scientific explanations. Many theorize that the Dutch ship was smuggling hazardous materials such as potassium cyanide and nitroglycerin. Seawater may have interacted with the cargo, causing the toxic gases to be released. And poison the crew. The nitroglycerin would later cause the explosion. Or maybe there was trouble in the boiler room and carbon monoxide killed the crew, and a fire got out of hand and destroyed the ship. What is most troubling is the fact that, although the Silver Star is very real, there isn't any registration records of the ship. Did the ship even exist, or is it merely a sailor's tale? Number 1. The Cape Intruder. This final unsolved case is not a famous case. But a local one that I remember from years ago, occurring in a neighboring town. If not for a brief mention of it in an old clip archive regarding a neighborhood watch, I might have thought it was just my imagination. Back in 2005, in the affluent town of Cape Elizabeth, Maine, the community experienced something unnerving. During the night, victims who kept their doors unlocked would wake up in the morning to catch a brief glimpse of a man staring at them. 
before they could react. The man would flee the scene, leaving the house just as it was before he entered it. Nothing was stolen. Nobody was injured or killed. All that he took was their privacy when he snuck into their bedrooms to watch them sleep. A rough sketch depicting a man in his early 20s played on the local news. Everybody seemed to think they knew who it was, and the police received a number of calls from concerned citizens naming possible suspects. Although two people named the same person, the police never did catch the cape intruder. After some intrusions in August, December, and February, he never did break in again. Perhaps he had his fill of staring at sleeping bodies during that time period. But the thought that such a person existed and still walks among us is enough to give anyone the chills. And of course, serves as a grim reminder to lock our doors. If you like this video and want to see more of this content, please like it, subscribe to the channel and click on the bell. And if you didn't like it, then write in the comments what exactly you didn't like. Thank you for the views, see you soon.